minutes before the official start time. So that means the first two minutes, uh, if you're looking at the recording or listening to the recording, you can uh, skip the two minutes. Okay, I will now go to slideshow. Let's hope it works a little bit up, a little bit down. Okay. If I go to slideshow, I lose the time. So I'm going to wait until it's 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock. Okay, it's three o'clock, so I will go into the slideshow. So today's ESD training. I think the company is, I talked this morning also with Stanley and uh, with uh, Ken uh, about ESD, and I think uh, we're serious. So they're investing quite a bit of money on in it or uh, expand the product portfolio. Uh, and uh, and also PDNing device, as you saw maybe uh, 10 minutes ago. Uh, but, uh, you know, so they're updating the product portfolio, I should put it like that, and they want to make this a focus point. So uh, the training is a little bit longer than usual, uh, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, feel free to interrupt me at any, at any stage now, because it's a little bit longer training. It's going to be 40, 45 minutes. So feel, don't wait until the end to, to ask questions. So I just, this is a slide I, I pinched from uh, Cisco somewhere. I saw this, I think from Kevin or something like that. And this is uh, ESD fits into EMC. So EMC test requirements, Electro uh, EMC stands for electromagnetic compatibility, AMV, electromagnetic particularly guide for people in Germany that use this word more often. The, the ones in the stars is that actually is what impact us. So ESD impacts us, uh, EFT or electric fast transient burst, power IO surge or lightning strikes in this case, radiated emissions that is uh, called EMI also uh, a lot. And that's a very important part also relevant for uh, diodes and harmonics and flicker. Uh, usually also sometimes the uh, rules around the power factor correction. So actually our diodes are very much involved with the uh, EMC and uh, with uh, these regulations and are impacting them quite a lot. A lot of people here see these are the biggest challenges. Uh, we'll see that a little bit later. ESD is there. It looks simple, but actually, if you look at the amount of field failures or quality problems, uh, if you look at it now, not from our perspective, but from our customers' perspective, a lot of the quality problems are linked to actually to ESD. So it's very important. And radiated emissions is the EMI caused by switching power supplies is another thing that is very difficult to control and very expensive actually to measure and do. So, so these are the two critical things and in both of these areas, our rectifiers are actually quite important. Uh, in this case, uh, in the case of radiated emissions, it's mainly Schottky and FER diodes or fast diodes that are important in output rectifiers, freewheeling, but also in power factor circuits. So those are, are very important norms. And this is the biggest challenge from a customer. So customers need to test this. And, uh, you know, sometimes we sit here and we cross reference a lot of parts and then we maybe want to put ourselves in the, in the, uh, in the feet or, you know, try to, to imagine the situation from our customer's perspective. So how easy is it to change a diode? And then, you know, the best thing you can do is look maybe at the data sheet of, of what your customers is making. Uh, an example would be a three dark uh, LED, LED driver here. That's a data sheet of that one here. I also looked at a Grundfos uh, three-phase water pump because my three-phase water pump in the house here broke down. So 
uh, interesting to study. And then you'll see that there are lots of safety standards, the CE sign that is linked to the IEC norm or EMC testing, but there are other uh, safety norms and lots of other standards to, to meet. And so people don't really particularly enjoy changing anything after that because any of that costs a lot of money. If there is an emergency, anything can happen, but normally people don't like it. Certainly not for a dial. Usually people uh, revisit their uh, circuit maybe once a year. And then, yeah, you can sneak another diode in because then, you know, if they're doing it for other components, then, you know, why not add a diode uh, from here? So the CE sign is the most famous one we know, uh, directly linked to EMC, but there are also safety requirements and other requirements that actually. Uh, influence the design and obviously your shot kit diode has a direct uh, immediate inf influence on the efficiency. If we state an efficiency, then the shot kit diode is also linked to a certain efficiency and, uh, and also, of course, maximum temperature allowed in the circuit and that type of stuff, which then gets to, uh, you know, in the end is a reliability question. So it's not so easy always uh, to change a diode. Uh, you know, it may sometimes take only 10 minutes, but sometimes uh, people will not be so happy to do it. And the reason, if you want to get a feeling for that, just look at a data sheet of your customers. And this is linked to EMC and ESD. And now we're talking to the official ESD set of the, the webinar. We're going to talk about the norms, especially about capacitance, because that's the most, the most important one. And we're just going to have some fun with the history of the devices. Then we'll have some data sheets uh, or analysis of the data, data sheets. Product overview, uh, you know, the products we have. Product positioning, you know, how do you know which product is the right one for which application? Uh, we're going to look at some other data sheet information that maybe is not in our data sheet, but in some of our competitors' uh, data sheet and find out if that is important information or not. Then we'll talk a little bit more about the layout. And actually, we're going to talk also about technology packages, front end and back end, because that is actually is important too. These ESD products, actually, they look simple, but they are not. Uh, that is the, the message, and sometimes you want to repeat something three times, so that's the one I'm going to repeat. They are more complex than they appear to be. This one is very famous, IEC 61000-4-2. Uh, these norms have been published uh, for more than 25 years now. Uh, the ESD level depends on what you make. Your product gets classified, either consumer or industrial with exposed parts. There are two levels, the contact and air discharge. Uh, this air discharge is, is very complex to measure, so people prefer to talk about contact discharge because the measurements are a little bit more repeatable. The IEC norms, there are other ESD norms out there, but I'm looking at it from our customer's perspective. We'll talk maybe a little bit more or we'll see some of the other norms a little bit later. But we're looking at our customer perspective and actually I'm the customer, so I have to test my circuit according to the IEC 61000-4-2. That's why these are considered the critical norms. We're going to look a little bit more here uh, and here. Uh, some things, uh, I'll just mention these things. So you see the current uh, at uh, uh, the peak current and the current at 30 nanoseconds. That can be 4 to 12 or 16 amps. So those are significant uh, currents uh, for such a short period of time. Uh, and at that stage, the energy is not small in them. So this is the overview of the norm. That's what everybody knows. So we're on the same map. These are what the waveforms look like. Uh, I took them out of our new data sheet. So uh, the figure seven is the IEC 61,000 pulse. So this is the way it looks like. Figure six, I always put this here. There is the eight to 20 microsecond wave pulse, eight microseconds rise time. 20 microseconds to the half of the voltage. That's where the 8 to 20 comes from. Uh, so 50% of the peak current is, uh, 20, is at uh, uh, 20 uh, microseconds. Uh, the reason for that pulse here, it's much longer, is you cannot test uh, the device 100% uh, against an ESD pulse. So in production, we have to do something. We have to test these devices. And to test these devices, we're actually using these 8 to 20 microsecond pulse waveforms. So that's why these waveforms always show up also on these data sheets. They are more linked to uh, EFT and lightning, but uh, these, these are also the test forms we use or the test waveform we use to measure the device in outgoing uh, inspection. Um, 
So uh, system level is IEC. So the most important formula I would like to point out to you is V is L di dt. L is the inductance here, the dt, the change in uh, current over time. Uh, if you measure uh, sometimes ESD pulses, you're seeing there is a 10 amp per nanosecond uh, uh, rise time DIDT. Now, every uh, millimeter PCB trace, roughly, we say it's about one nano Henry. Uh, so that's a, a factor of 10 minus 9. So you can actually see that that uh, for these rise times, actually, every nano Henry of inductance becomes important. This is something to remember uh, because the layout of the printed circuit board becomes uh, important. So the L one nano Henry here is is important. If you have a normal circuit where you, you switch uh, one amp in a microsecond, nobody notices the uh, the inductance. But with ESD, you do notice the inductance because of the high DIDT uh, involved. So that's something to remember from this ESD pulse waveform. Capacitance. This is going back to school. Uh, if you put two resistors in series, actually you add the value, the same with uh, the uh, inductances. The capacitor is different. It's uh, 1 over JWC uh, is the impedance. And so uh, actually it works completely different. In the case of capacitances, if you put them in parallel, you have to add them. If you put them in series, the smallest one is going to determine what the final capacitance is. This is extremely important to remember this because if something is too high of a capacitance, you put something with a low capacitance in series and then the capacitance goes down. Underneath that little uh, table there where you see resistor, capacitor, inductor, you see actually the formula for capacitance. Uh, the capacitance CT here is a bunch of material constants and A divided by W. Uh, the, the things here are look very uh, complex, the names here, but A actually is just a die size. So it's actually very simple. You increase or decrease the die size and then actually, uh, you know, that inf influences the A. So a bigger die will have a bigger capacitance. A smaller die will have a smaller capacitance. The W is the width of the depletion layer. This is determined by the diffusion and also by the voltage. So that's why the um, the capacitance of a, of a device is actually um, you know voltage dependent, and that's because it, the, the uh, it determines the width of the depletion region. That's in a PN junction. That's where all the electrons are. So how do I get actually a low capacitance? In the old days, it's very simple. You, in your in one device, you would put a diode in series with the TBS, and you would have a small capacitance in series with a large capacitance, and the capacitance would go down. And uh, this is what you see in these graphs here in the top left corner. If you want to do this bidirectionally, you do it in both directions, and you have a low capacitance in both series. And then, of course, you can use them as a bridge and just use one where you know everything is actually guided into that TVS. So that is the trick you use for uh, low capacitance. However, this is has its limitations. At one stage, uh, you're going to see that you cannot shrink the capacitance uh, any longer. You cannot make the die smaller anymore. So at one stage, you'll see that a TVS, uh, you know, or an ESD diode becomes from similar to a Zener in technology, maybe a little bit optimized to something you put in series there in one package, maybe to actually very complex technology. So if you look at things, uh, you go to one picofarad or two picofarad type design, you are actually looking at multi-layer CMOS processes. So actually these dumb looking uh, ESD diodes are actually complex ICs uh, and they're not just dumb uh, uh, Zener diodes anymore. So this is something you need to, to keep in mind. So we need to go down with the, the, with the capacitance and go down and down. But there are limits to what we can do uh, with normal technology. And then, uh, you know, we're going to show you uh, products with 0 0.8 or 0 0.2 or something like that type of pick of fire and capacitance. Those are actually multi-layer CMOS IC processes. I won't stop with somebody. There were 15 layer. That's nearly as uh, complex IC, just as complex as a as a DC DC converter, you know, so they're very complex to manufacture. That's why you actually also see people, not just uh, the small people in there, but actually you also see people like Texas instruments, you know, 
supplying ESD products uh, uh, to for protection. Because actually, this is not simple technology. It's complex. Here we go in the history. Uh, I'm not sure if your Jacques is on the line, but we used to sell uh, SMB TVS in the yeah, 90s. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, do you remember the days when we sell SMB TVS for 25 cents, Jean-Jacques? Yeah, oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, so those were the good days, right? So, uh, in the end, in the old days, when we were young, uh, you know, you had the, for the printer, you had the RS-232 port. And then you could put a TVS there for ESD protection. You can do a big show. And then, uh, you know, uh, and then you know you you could sell a lot of money in a uh, in a printer port, you know, uh, for one dollar or something for ESD protection. So those were great days, uh, and the speed was low, and the TVS could provide this ESD protection because uh, on the left I put the capacitance curves of uh, our uh, friendly competitor ST in this case. Uh, of course, you've seen last time in the last slide. You've seen if you two put two capacitances in series. And then, of course, uh, the EU, and they are the same, then you, of course, half them. So that's why the capacitance of a unidirectional and a bidirectional TBS are never the same. Uh, so the unidirectional is always higher capacitance than the bidirectional capacitance. Some of our capacitance curves, uh, I'm not probably not telling you any secrets in our data sheets, especially also on rectifiers, are unreliable. So uh, our, a lot of our capacitance measurements are simply wrong. Anyway, these were the dates when you, we could sell uh, SMB TVS or SMA TVS in actually a uh, ESD protection environment. But of course, you can see here also a thousand picofarad is not a small capacitance. Even if we go for RS232, 15, uh, 15 volt, then you know you can see you're still at uh, 500 uh, to uh, you know 10, 15 volt. You can still see uh, 200, 300 picofarad. It's not small. Uh, they can handle it, but they uh, they uh, at the at the one stage they were at the limit. You know, an RS uh, two three two. You know, the, the the transmission is a couple of uh, ten kilobit per second, right? So there is no for the, the 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 younger people. So there was no actually data to really transfer. It was a really slow slow device. Here we are, and now we're looking at USB signals. I'm actually took a, a picture. I pinched this from. Our friends from Little Fuse, and they are varistors because we are competing with varistors. Uh, varistors have a low capacitance there, but they are not as slow, uh, not as fast as uh, as uh, uh, silicon. So, but it is a competitor on on these uh, on these devices uh, to be aware of. Here we are, USB one. This is also already a long, long time ago, but the transmission date is at 12 megabit per second. That's already a thousand times faster than RS232, but uh, you know, or 500 times. And then you go to US uh, 2.0. That's not too old. That's still uh, in use a lot. And there you are, already at 480 megabit per second. Now here you see what happens if you put a capacitance on the line. It becomes a filter actually. And uh, so black uh, is without device. The, uh, the the red one has a 0 0.0.5 picofarad. That's smaller than what you can do with a TBS. The yellow is a one picofarad device. Uh, that would be typically also our type of device. Then you would have an older 10 picofarad device, and then you have the 700 picofarad uh, device in green, which would be uh, similar to uh, 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 an SMB TVS. So actually, if you see here already, the 700 picofarad device no longer is that good anymore on a uh, simple USB at 12 megabit per second. It it no longer is a zero one or clear zero one. It becomes a little bit of a of a turnover. Maybe it's still acceptable, but it comes a borderline. Here we are in the modern days. We're more on the right hand side and the bottom side here, 480 megabit per second. Here and here you see the one pico fired just about does it. The 10 pico fired there, uh, the blue dotted line, is already distorting the signal quite a bit. And uh, the 700 pico fired is just a filter, it filters everything out. So that no signal or no zero ones come through a, a TVS or a, a normal varistor here. So you can see here is a good graphic visualization of uh, of the impact of the of the, the capacitance on the on the data signal quality of the of the of, of the, the zero one transmission rates. So, so here you can see that you know one pico fire is about right here. 
uh, but uh, you know, if you go over one picofarad, there's a clear distortion, and that's the, the world the way it is, and uh, you know, uh, that's um, uh, you know, that's why you need to uh, understand the influence of a capacitance. It's a filter essentially. In this case, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So here, so here we have the ESD history. So 30 years ago, ESD was a subset of the TVS market. The data line speeds grow. The capacitance needed to go down. The TVS no longer was good enough. ST had planar processes to address this need. So if you want to make a good five volt uh, protection device in a single, you know, like in an SOD 123 or 323, uh, five volt, you cannot do it with a GPP process. You need a planar process with iron implantation. ST already had this 30 years ago. So we're, they were the first to get off the ground with this low capacitance, uh, small die uh, in, in the early 90s. So they also were the first to come up with monolithic ESD protection arrays uh, in the early 90s for uh, mobile phones for Nokia. And then, you know, uh, the market from that grew and grew as the uh, speeds, uh, USB -B and all these fast connectors came into the, the world and then basically the uh, the capacitors had to go down and down. So it came from a subset to the market that is now actually the same size or even bigger than a TVS market. So it's a, it's a, a big market here. Maybe not for us so much here in Europe. Eh? You can imagine we of course have USB and the HDMI, but you can imagine that in Asia uh, they have many many more of those uh, connectors. But we still have a lot of connectors here in Europe, so it's not. You cannot neglect it anymore. The field failures, somebody, there are statistics. It's not really a 100% reliable statistic, but some people say that if you look at it from a customer's perspective, 30% of all failures are caused by ESD or by uh, EOS uh, on the line. And this is uh, quite a lot. And that's why it has to be taken serious. It destroys everything. It destroys the gate oxide of a MOSFET, and not just our MOSFETs. Uh, some of them you see sometimes have uh, ESD protection on the gate, so it does, uh, you know, this destroy the gate oxide of MOSFETs. But also, of course, of course, those MOSFETs could also be the interface on the IC, uh, and that's a voltage thing. Then it melts the silicon. Uh, that is sometimes you see that on the Schottky diode, they can be destroyed by uh, by uh, ESD. And that's just the same failure mode as with uh, over voltage, just uh, you know, melt, uh, you know, in the corner of the die and melted silicon. But it also melts the metallization, and that's purely current. So sometimes on the ICs, internally it, it melts the metallization. So the failure modes are all over the place uh, with ESD, and uh, they are multiple. And it's the number one uh, failure mode in general considered for uh, for products for electronic products in, in general. Um, then, you know, and, and ESD, uh, this is also something I should say. You see all these pulses, and they are also with uh, ESD guns and all that. But of course, uh, you can't tell ESD what to do. I mean, there is no such thing as a, a norm here, it can only be a description. ESD pulse does whatever it does, and uh, it can look any type or shape, uh, but it will probably, hopefully, look like uh, what the uh, pulse or the norm pulse from the ESD gun looks like. So, but of course, ESD does whatever it wants to. It can be completely different. Um, now, let's talk about um, the, and things that I, I've got a typo here. Sorry about that. There is uh, it, of, of course, automotive is not mainly low capacitance. In in uh, in uh, automotive is mainly low speed. I should say. If you look at the CAN and the LIN bus, uh, and uh, you know, and even flex ray. In this case, actually, what you see is that the capacitance is not that important. So, actually, you are actually uh, more looking at the center type of uh, uh, te the technology here to to meet the uh, to meet the the norms here. We'll talk a little bit later about it because it also revolves around failure modes. Is uh, you know uh, how does a, a ESD protection device fail? And this is another area of completely black magic. Uh, the automotive norms, uh, the, the ESD pulses are uh, similar, but they have a higher capacitance. So they actually have a higher energy uh, in them. So they probably need a little bit bigger zeners in there than with standard uh, uh, diodes, but it can be done by, by fairly standard uh, bidirectional zener planar technology. So this is. Uh, so the automotive, uh, automotive uh, norms are not that challenging. Uh, 
uh, they should say automotive mainly low speed not uh, capacitance here the title sorry uh, then of course here we go uh, we stopped last time already at the usb with the 400 megabit per second when i showed you the uh, influence of the capacitance of on the, the on the the signal and it just goes up and up from there right so uh, you know the latest usb norm is uh, 40 gigabit per second uh, and uh, we also have a few hdmi uh connectors probably in our house in some application here and that's also six gigabit per second so you can imagine that uh, so those things are going to be, if already the 480 megabit per second was challenging for one picofarad, you can imagine that, uh, or 10 picofarad, you can imagine what those higher uh, speed signals are going to look like. So they are more challenging than, uh, than on capacity than ever. We've got 15 active products as of, uh, that was as of uh, two hours ago. I think we have 12 active products now because we're, PDNing the 0503, they told me this morning. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about these products here. The selection guide is not bad. Uh, you can see the capacitance here, the number of channels. So that gives you an idea at least where to look for easily to find a solution. Uh, and the other thing, the working voltage VWM is also indicated here. The peak power uh, rating really is irrelevant. There's you know, that's the 820 and the die size and that type of stuff, but you're never going to exceed the peak, peak power rating uh, with, a, with an ESD pulse. So here we have six devices that are, um, I would say, sellable uh, in theory, uh, but some of them are better than others. And we'll go through one by one how to position them in the, uh, in the market. As you can tell, we also have uh, six different packages, SOT23, SOT23, SOT26. SOT uh, SOD 323, SOT 363, and two more packages. And this is an, an other area, of course, of complexity of the ESD market, uh, you know, and how to compete in it. But capacitors you can find easily on our website, the working voltage and the number of channels. So that's already a good, good start uh, to see where we are going. What else do you need to know? Um, this one here, we've got nine of these products here, uh, 1005, 603, and 503 devices. Uh, so it says 0503 may get PDN. Uh, actually, it got it uh, two hours ago. So apparently, they can't uh, get the subconscious supply anymore. But I think, actually, I don't know if anybody sells these devices, uh, has a luck getting orders on this, but they are gold plated and not thin plated. I think, uh, you know, they are difficult to solder. And I think if you can get an order for this, uh, you know, Taiwan Semiconductor should give you a medal because this is uh, not so uh, easy to sell gold plated parts. You can also make uh, lifetime enemies of design engineers if they have to solder this uh, by themselves on a, on a PCB in a lab. So uh, nobody particularly likes uh, gold plated parts. So I don't think those nine devices or six devices now are maybe going to go very far. Then we have a few more. Uh, let's look at those that we can sell. Um, here, this is our new device, right? It's got five volt and below. This is important to, to understand. If you have three by three or something like that volts, then you can also use a five volt device. It's not gonna make that much difference in ESD damping voltage or performance. So this is something uh, you need to know, uh, you know, five volt is the minimum, but uh, you know, that means 3.3 volt on a line is also possible with this device. So it's bi-directional, it's in the 40 picofarad area, and uh, you know, we'll go a little bit more to the data sheet here. So SOD 323 device here. It's got all the things in the data sheet, 30 kilovolt air, 30 kilovolt contact. Uh, so those are the, the most uh, demanding norms and the demanding energy here. And it's got 12 amp on an 820 pulse. So that's more than enough to manage all ESD uh, applications. Uh, the uh, application area are a little bit vague here. Uh, it could be any per peripherals, but we're going to look a little bit later on here. It's important, and I will repeat this also, is uh, to look at ESD in two, two ways. Uh, if there is a bus, sometimes there is power on that bus, like, uh, you know, like charging your computer through a USB or, or something else, uh, hanging on your computer and charging it via a USB port. So there is power and there are data, and this we need to distinguish. So this is maybe not for the data lines, this is more for the power lines uh, in this area. And it's also uh, good on, for example, industrial application, IO buttons and things like that. If you need 
uh, protection there, then actually the uh, capacitance is not really such a big thing here. Let's look a little bit more at the data sheet here. So the big pulse rating 820, those are just a test programs, right? We need to test them uh, at OQC to see if they work. Then 30 kilovolt, we probably take five or 10 or 20 devices and test them and uh, then it works well. We remember the uh, biggest air discharge or uh, air, air discharge and contact discharge in the norm is 30 kilovolt. But, you know, uh, there are applications uh, I've seen where we have to borrow equipment from uh, the German army to go to 60 kilovolt and 40 kilovolt. So ESZ can, can go even higher than 30 kilovolt. Huh? So the rest of the thing in the data sheet is just like a TVS data sheet where you have the reverse breakdown voltage, which you really, or the reverse working voltage, where you really don't want to, uh, that you don't want to exceed. So the device does not conduct anything else here. The junction capacitance is, is measured here, uh, 3645 uh, picofarad. In this case, in the norm here, you always have to look at the uh, voltage at which is measured. Sometimes it's measured. Some people measure at four volt, whatever, or rectifiers. It's best to measure at zero volt because that's the really the worst case scenario. And that's also how you have to compare. But watch out, people might actually cheat on that and measure it at a higher voltage. So they have a better value. So this occasionally happens in the industry. Our friends in the headquarters uh, made uh, a lot of work here uh, to make the data sheet here. They even have a residual, uh, uh, you know, this is what we should really have on our TBS uh, and which we can get uh, uh, basically um, uh, up on the mount, right, on the top left curve. Uh, so never ever does the uh, uh, does the energy go to zero at 150 degrees C on a, uh, on a TVS device. There's always some residual energy left here. In this case, 20%. Uh, in the case of TVS, SMB, and that type of stuff, it could be 50%. This is important for people in automotive applications. Maybe not if you're making a USB uh, uh, interface design or something else, or a power device interface design. Here you see the other curves are here, the repetitive big pulse curve. Again, it's on 820, so that's why you see the 130 there somewhere on the 20 microsecond line interact. It's again not important because as we see, uh, ESD is shorter than one microsecond, so it's on the left of this curve even, so it's much higher there uh, in theory. The rest, the clamping voltage uh, versus peak uh, current. This is good. This is on 820 uh, microsecond pulses, gives you the internal resistance. But also, uh, of course, these pulses are very slow, so it's very uh, reliable environment. The capacitance here, we mentioned this already, 36 picofarad at uh, zero volt, going down to uh, the working voltage, uh, 25 picofarad in that area. So those are important data for the designers to have, and that's how you read these data sheets. So in this case, all the important data is available here. There's something new here, TLP, transmission line pulses. So these are, I say new in ESD data sheets, they're not really there, they're already for 10 years. And so what happens is you put a 100 nanosecond uh, pulse, similar uh, with voltage and that type of stuff, uh, uh, on an impedance line uh, with 50, milli ohm, 50 ohm, so it's like the old transmission line uh, theories from, from your uh, student days. And, and then you're gonna measure the currents and then you get this graph, which means the, the transmission line pulse uh, graph, which gives you actually the inter you know, internal impedance of the device. This is complex to explain, but actually an ESD device is always in parallel to something. Uh, usually, let's say in USB, it's the, uh, you, know, uh, you know, in parallel with the USB uh, uh, interface uh, port. Now, all these ICs, they have ESD protection on board. Uh, you heard, you've heard of human body model and that type of stuff. Uh, these are not system tests, these are component tests, but everything has to have a little bit of uh, ESD protection on, on, on board. So what happens is you have two ESD protections in parallel. You have our ESD protection, which we are selling, which is very good and has very high capability. And you have the IC uh, ESD capability, which is very poor because it costs a lot of money to do it on the chip and is easily destroyed. So the reason, so what they're doing with this transmission line pulses is they see how these two things act in parallel. 
So on the top right hand, uh, the bottom right hand corner, you see in black there, that's the IC by itself. And, you know, you test it and at 13 volts, the thing breaks down and it becomes, uh, you know, uh, gets destroyed here. The DVS themselves, they don't get destroyed. They're like a, the, 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 the green line with a, uh, you know, internal, uh, uh, with an internal uh, resistance. If you put them in parallel, and this is what the TLP curves tells you, is you actually, the original device was destroyed at 13 volts, roughly in that area, and eight amp. Uh, that's what it says in the small print there. If you can read that under that, uh, you know, red dotted line, actually that gets improved to 24 amps. So you actually uh, increase the energy uh, by a factor of three because you uh, the current before destruction now becomes uh, 24 amp. So that's actually how this works. It it's uh, it's not perfect and there's a little bit of black magic here. I'm afraid always, but these TLP uh, curves are included in the data sheets and this is actually how they are used uh, to work in parallel with the IC to see how much you will improve the, uh, the the robustness of the design. Some of the other products we have, we have six products, we said, right, uh, one of the new ones here, and then we have five more products. So let's look here at the, uh, this one here. Apparently, according to uh, our friends in, uh, in Asia, according to Ken and Stanley, with this one, they actually have about 50 customers in Asia. This, so this is their high runner. Uh, the DFN 1006 package is a, a small package with a very low height and that type of stuff. Um, it's not, you know, for example, you can't probably can't use this with uh, automotive applications because it's a pressure contact. So it's not from uh, reliability testing. It's not a perfect device, but it does perfectly for ESD. As you can imagine, uh, we can talk a lot about uh, reliability and whatever, but of course, an ESD part never sees any stress or doesn't see any really power cycling or any or any stress whatsoever <coughs> so actually this is their number one device in uh, taiwan the two picofarad is not that great so it's uh, it's going to be uh, on uh, pretty slow uh, slow uh, buses uh, things like that uh, and older interfaces and uh, things like that but it is uh, uh, the biggest high runner we are having at the moment with the fn 1006 package this one the second device here, and so this is five volt, uh, two picofarad, so uh, it can do, and it's got, uh, doesn't have uh, a big die in here, as you can tell. Uh, the other one here, this is uh, for, uh, you know, so actually they come, uh, you know, as I said, and we'll look a little bit more at circuits later on. There's usually a power line, then there's one data line, two data lines, or four data line. HDMI uh, and uh, some of the newer USB standards have four data line. This is handled by this type of package uh, in the, uh, the name is, is in the year 2510P10, but that's a, it's a DFN, they call it DFN package, it is a more common uh, name here. So this is actually a very small package here. We see we have 0 0.8 picofarad. It's got a new device on the roadmap with a lower uh, uh, capacitance here. So to keep up with the evolving HDMI standards. So this is uh, aimed, of course, at four data lines here, which you will find at the more high-end USB and HDMI uh, standards here. But here, uh, probably in the future, we're gonna have a lower capacitance version. So it's probably uh, not gonna be something you're designing uh, for a new part. This one here is the SOT23, and this is also a high runner. So, uh, on USB 2, uh, it's got 0 0.6 uh, picofarad, 5 volt, and it's actually in a relatively big package, so SOT 26, but it, it does fine here. So you have here, you have uh, four IOs here. Uh, so you have four IOs, also your four parts here. It's kind of like, an, uh, you know, a little bit difficult to see there, the, the circuit diagram, it's kind of small here, sorry about that. But, you know, of course you have one ground pin and one, uh, VDD print, that, which is a five volt, you, so you dump the energy either in the ground or uh, on the power supply rail, and then you have a steering diode. So you know one steering diode grows to the ground, and the other diode goes to the the side of the TBS. And that was a guy drilling in the in the hole, the hole in the, in the downstairs. So this is actually a good device here, and it will have some life left in it because the six, 0 0.6 picofarad is still okay for some industrial uh, applications on 2.0 uh, 
uh, USB and some other of these uh, interfaces. <laughs> this one here, uh, that's still on the list, but a three pico fire, it's not gonna go anywhere. So uh, on SOP 3263, so that's probably not a device that's gonna go uh, a long distance anymore. So as you can tell, we have one new device uh, and uh, two devices which are high runners here. Uh, and that uh, you need to add with this device. This is, uh, it says here, uh, USB, but it's a 24 volt device. So actually you can probably put that in industrial applications. So anywhere where there is industrial interface, but that stuff, you can actually easily use that. It's a dual SOC 23. So this is a, a perfect device for industrial application. It's just that it, it doesn't really, you know, from, if you look at the data sheet, uh, you know, that's maybe not the, the right application areas in the data sheet, maybe power over it and internet, it can do something, but I think that's 48 volts. So over, also over there, it would struggle to, uh, to, to actually be effective. So that goes, I'll just go back one more slide. Sorry about this. A few more slides here. Sorry. I hope it stabilizes. I will calm down for a second until it stabilizes here. So you, you can tell here that the uh, the one the, the, so a couple of them are are, are working here. The SOT twenty six at the bottom of the the, the, the red circle is there. The SOT three two six on top of that three pick of fire too high. The uh, DS on ten for HDMI with four lines zero point eight okay ish, but we'll have a lower capacitance version in the future. And then we have the DFN 1006 bidirectional, which is our high runner there at two picofarads. And then you have the 11 picofarad SOT 23 device, which which actually uh, is uh, is maybe more industrial. You might be able to sell it uh, somewhere in, in industrial applications. I'm going to go down now to where I was. And here we, we are here, he updated this. So if you have a roadmap, he updated it this morning. So it's a slightly different here. So those two parts here, uh, look at the roadmap a little bit and split it in two, right? You can see he has uh, parts coming out. The first one he just released and the one coming out is a 0.4 picofarad. So you see them at 0 0.4, 0 0.2 uh, picofarad, one channel, two channels, four channels, different packages and that type of stuff. Those are very fast data lines that you cannot only use on the fastest data line, but also on older data lines. And then you have a second group of parts, so which are uh, like 45 picofarad, nine picofarad, and then coming up in the 98 and 42 pico fire. So those are more used on, on lines where actually uh, <coughs> power is transmitted or uh, IO buttons or that type of stuff where the capacitance is nothing uh, uh, special. And also, frankly speaking, where you know the technology is nothing special, it's just uh, you know bi-directional zeners, whereas the other ones are, are very complex uh, CMOS ICs. So that's actually the roadmap to explain where it is. So we're actually gonna build, uh, as you can see here, we're gonna build a, a bunch of building blocks, right? One channel, two channel, four channel, low capacitance, and uh, one channel uh, uh, high capacitance in one or two packages. So, so that's what we're doing. We're building a number of building blocks here that can address most of that, the applications and most of the interfaces available there in the industry. So let's look at product, product positioning. So this, uh, I already gave it away. Uh, we're building the, uh, the, 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 the product portfolio uh, and let's, let's look at it here. So actually, you know, you can actually look at uh, every interface in the world and how it's made and how it's protected here. Little Fuse has documents so you can copy or, or study. That's what I do. I don't invent anything new. Uh, so does Texas Instruments. So does, uh, to a lesser extent, uh, ST and also actually uh, on semi and also next period. Don't forget next period. So there's tons of things. Every interface in the world is is uh, is described in that type of stuff. I'm just using this one USB one. I think nobody uses that anymore, but I but I, I use it just to be uh, to make it easy is you have the top, you have the VBUS, which is a five volt line. So who cares about the capacitance? So you can tell here that the the the, the uh, capacitance they use here is uh, 30 picofarads or something like that. So that's just perfectly fine. Uh, and then of course, on the two data lines here, you really want to have a uh, low capacitance here <coughs> in order not to, uh, in order not to disturb the signal or, or, you know, yeah. 
distort the signal is the right word. So this is, is where we are, and that's uh, the, the key uh, feature for every interface, HDMI, USB 4. You can read it in TI and Xperia, how to do it, uh, and, and, and what the, the correct format is. So we can borrow that. We don't need to make it uh, again here. So that's, and it's very well described. So you can tell that from a marketing perspective, this is actually not a bad business, right? I mean, in TVS, you have to make a thousand partners before you get your portfolio. Over here, I mean, you know, you don't, you know, you know, you can't do it really with 10 or 15, but it's not that you need it, uh, you know, you, you can easily do it with, with 20 or 30 or something. Or not. So, so you, you, it's easier to market and, and easier to do. Uh, the other thing here is that, of course, the package is going to influence the layout here. So we look at the top here, the data line are going through the, the package and you route it that way. As we mentioned here, if you go from here, from the data line to the package, every nano Henry, as you remember, uh, is, uh, you know, if you multiply that with the 10, 10 amp per nanosecond is an, a voltage overshoot. So the layout here, uh, the package also influences what layout is possible. DVS selection uh, uh, criteria, I, of course, this needs to be is also a lot of typo I need to change is ESD selection criteria. So first you look at the uh, capacitance on the data lines, then you look at the working voltage, and then you know, look at the number of channels in the package. And then, of course, you do a clamping voltage and energy check. So it's the same as TVS, but you have to add the capacitance uh, 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 into the equation and the capacitance uh, is, in many cases, the most important. Uh, Parameter here. Um, so here is another, uh, e e you know, all semiconductor has, and I'll tell you a little bit about the problem about uh, the downside of the ESD uh, product and marketing here. So with all semiconductor, you can just go to uh, to the, the interface, and then uh, they they spit out the parts to there too. So that is, uh, you know, of course, if you have two hundred eight uh, ESD product protection products, you can you can do that. But it's maybe uh, also an excessive way of marketing here. We can do it with with fewer products. We'll just have to be more inventive. But I just wanted to make sure that you knew that these uh, these things were there. Uh, the TI one is handy, so it has every every port here, and then it says which device is optimal for every port. Uh, and that is, of course, uh, you know, then you can easily sneak out and say, okay, uh, this is uh, this is a good device. Uh, how can we copy that? So, if a customer comes actually says, I need a, a, an easy protection for uh, for a VGA or something like that. Uh, us. So this is another tool or something else we can actually uh, pinch from the competition and use uh, to our own advantage. So the main problem we have in uh, ESD protection is the uh, multiple packages. Uh, we it's kind of like product miniaturization to to a certain extent. The die size is is peanuts or doesn't exist really in, in ESD. So it's small, 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 and the smaller the lower the capacitance anyway. So you can go and make the packages smaller and smaller. So uh, in the case of uh, old semiconductor, they have. 45 products uh, with ESD. So that's, of course, excessive. Uh, and uh, this is uh, 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 no way. And you're probably going to get initially say we have ESD products. So you're probably going to get uh, the, the freak designs and the, the ones that are single source to people asking that just up front there, be aware of it. Uh, there's a lot of chip scale packaging uh, out there with bump dies and that type of stuff. In theory, that's the best ESD because it has no inductance anywhere, but that's not solderable. And that's something people use on mobile phones or, or applications like that that are with super uh, processes, but we're not going to, we're not in that type of business anyway. So, yes, many packages, but we're going to uh, look at the more industrial ones, the SOP 323 and that type of stuff, which are easy, not just to reflow, but also to waste solder. So that's uh, something to take into account. And then, of course, the DFN package uh, we're also focusing on, which is small, but it is a pressure contact. So it's not particularly uh, going to be liked by automotive people, uh, but that's not our market at the moment anyway, but maybe long term it will be. But then we will need uh, different packages uh, to uh, quantify this market. So let's look a little bit more at what else is on the uh, on other people's data sheets here that you're aware of people who question this or something like that. Uh, the thing, uh, the the ESD response time. First and for all, uh, if you do two ESD measurements or three ESD measurements or ten ESD measurements, they will never look the same. Air discharge is is you know depends how you hold the the, the ESD gun. The relative humidity is a mess to reproduce it. So. 
So you can look at graphs like this, but you know, you can't make it a second time. The second one is, is of course, uh, contact discharge, slightly easier to reproduce and, and to make. But again, here, uh, you know, it, it might depend on the relative humidity of your setup and so on. So, uh, and how you hold your ESD gun. And uh, so it's, you know, it's not something that you have to take it all with a grain of salt. Uh, well, that, what is important to understand, though, is that we have this initial high voltage peak on the ESD pulse, and then we have the clamping voltage at 30 nanoseconds, which sometimes is mentioned. And that's where most of the energy is. And according to the people in the know, that's where the failures or some of the failures happens when you melt devices. So sometimes people uh, ask for the clamping voltage at 30 nanoseconds, but then that's difficult to generate because it really is dependent on the layout, the setup, and the whole lot. So no two ESD test results will ever look the same, but this is an important thing people are looking at in, in, in sometimes in information. The second one here, it becomes very cosmic here, is an eye diagram. Uh, according to the people, uh, according to Ken, uh, there is no, uh, we don't have this uh, in uh, our data sheets. Uh, and actually only the people that make USB uh, ICs themselves will have this uh, this capability to characterize them. So that might put us in some customers. Uh, we've seen it in Comscope. Uh, I've seen people asking the a, a, the eye diagram. Um, it actually is equipment that is not available in uh, free labs. Uh, it's something that if you develop a USB interface, you have. Uh, otherwise, it's very difficult to find this type of equipment to do it. What an eye diagram does, as you can tell here, we're talking about uh, things going at 10 gigabits uh, per second or even more with the new one, 40 gigabit per second. So what happens here is, um, is, is then, you know, what is a zero, what is a one? And it's, uh, I could have chosen a better one here is that you have to make sure that the lines don't cross this little gray thing in the middle there. Because if, if it crosses that, then it no longer can be recognized as a zero or a one. So that's what an eye diagram does. So this is in, in the, the data sheets of Xperia and Texas Instruments and sometimes ST also, uh, but not in, in other people's data sheet, but it's something you need to be aware of. Uh, the other one that, that comes in there that is more common in a, a data sheet is simply the insertion loss. That, so that is, is, is essentially the, uh, the capacitance is, is a filter. So uh, you measure the, the, uh, the three uh, decibel point, uh, you know, loss of insertion loss here, and that gives you a certain frequency. So uh, 12 gigahertz or, or whatever it is in this case. So that's a, a more uh, elegant way maybe to, uh, to characterize capacitance, but uh, it's essentially the same thing as capacitance, it's just in a more elegant way of uh, of uh, producing it in a data sheet the number one problem of uh, esd is uh, is the layout uh, and uh, we are sometimes our customers uh, because our type of business is we we you know we work with uh, uh how shall we say simple customers you know sometimes there's also no synergy because the um, uh, the, the guy that does the ESD uh, protection in, in a company uh, sits in the other side of the building from the people that make the power supply. And unfortunately, we don't have the MOSFETs for those uh, USB uh, power supply circuits. So, but what happens is uh, we, a lot of our power supply people or circuits are on two layer uh, PCBs or four layer PCBs. But if you do a USB interface, it's on eight or 16 layer type of PCBs. So it's very difficult to connect to make sure that the, uh, the, 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 the pulse, the ESD pulse doesn't sneak through and that type of stuff. I think, uh, you know, maybe I, I don't think, so it's the number one issue. I think there are dozens of application nodes available in the industry. I'm thinking about ST uh, has uh, many of them, but also TI has some and, and Semtech has some very good ones. So I don't think uh, we're going to get any questions of it. We've got some. Uh, simple uh, comments in our uh, um, data sheet let the path length between the protected uh, lines and the uh, be minimal. Uh, that means every millimeter is a nano Henry. Place it next to the uh, input terminals or connectors. Uh, you know, I'm just reading the dotted the, the bullet points there. Uh, that's also uh, very common, and I think everybody knows that. The ESD parent uh, return path to ground should be kept as short as possible. So again. And no leads. 
and that type of stuff and use ground planes wherever possible. That means dedicate another uh, one layer of your PCB just for the ground. <coughs> so essentially that is very simple information. Uh, people can write application notes of 20 pages about this, uh, these subjects and it has been done. Maybe we'll get questions about it, but I think it's by now, it's nothing new anymore. It's been addressed for the last 10 years. So I don't think they'll ask us specific any questions here. So, so that's the number one issue though, is, is layout. And that's why uh, ESD protection sometimes fails after it has been done. And as a result, uh, people still complain afterwards. Um, the layout is complex, it's a, so it causes failures. So the designer has little incentive to change. I'm, a, I'm sorry to tell you, once uh, this is not an easy measurement and not an easy layout. So once it's done, you know, um, you know, if you come with a second source, I'm not sure the designer is gonna be too happy to change, you know, unless there is something really uh, like a delivery problem or something, they'll do it. But, you know, it's it's not an, an easy sell uh, once the design has been frozen because it's linked to the CE side and it's very difficult to test and do so repetitively. So the people are happy that they pass ESD and then afterwards they want to run away from the problem and not look at it again anymore. So it's not so easy to uh, go in afterwards. Technology. Um, our friends from uh, ST and uh, Nextpeer are now promoting also four layer technology. I'm not gonna go into details of uh, thyristors in this case, but let's say that they have a lower internal resistance and as a result, they turn lower, but they of course are a little bit more complex and they have something called a hold current, which is, uh, you know, if the current stays over that hold current, the device doesn't turn off. So it's a risk here. So, but in general, again, I'm going to repeat that low capacitance DVS technology is very complex. Uh, so, uh, if you go to these uh, one picofarad or 0.4 picofarad type of devices, they're very difficult to design. They're for, for 15 layer processes sometimes, uh, IC processes. So, don't underestimate. You're not just selling a Zener anymore uh, when you're selling a 0.8 picofarad device. It's complex. On chip protection diode, we already talked about that, just but that's important to understand. Um, here you see here on the right hand side a small thing of um, silicon die areas for device level ESD two kilovolt human body model. Human body model is the thing we're using uh, internally to uh, in the industry to characterize our uh, our products. Not uh, the the system level is IEC, but we use that. If you look at an IC from Texas Instruments. It will have the human body model uh, capability here. So in the past, people were hiding uh, the ESD protection underneath the pads, and that was good. Uh, and uh, so you could you could actually get some 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 immunity from ESD that way. But uh, you know, as the the shrimp shrinks, the 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 dye were shrinking all the time. You know, in the uh, here you see the relationship of a bond pad on the left hand side. To, uh, uh, to what it takes to, to build a, an 8 kilovolt IEC uh, protection uh, device, ESD TBS dice, uh, die here. So you can see it's much larger, so you would use, waste a lot of space on a very uh, expensive uh, IC. So in that case, you know, it has to go external. So, but on chip protection is there, and that's why we have these transmission line pulses. They, they usually are steering diodes, so they dump the stuff into the ground or into the power line. And, uh, and that's why we need to have these uh, TLP pulses to see how our device works in parallel with these type of things here. So this is very complex sometimes, and here, this from a technology perspective, that's where the failures happen, and that's where you get uh, angry people, uh, you know, talking to you. Also, customers. Uh, you sometimes don't recognize this and then change the device and uh, and it's no data sheet. And then, uh, of course, the ESD doesn't work anymore. It's another famous uh, failure mode in the industry. And this one actually here is from Sophie Chang from two or three, three weeks a week. Uh, you know, uh, the inductance of the package uh, becomes uh, very important here. So we're talking, we were talking in the past up to 10 gigahertz, but if we're going to 40 gigahertz, we're actually starting to become RF designers with, uh, you know, the capacitance and the inductance, uh, the capacitance of the die and the inductance of the, 
of the package, uh, you know, resonating and uh, building filters. So that's another area there that for the future uh, where we're seeing a lot of research here. So this is an area where uh, currently the research is, it's not so much on, uh, on, on layout anymore. That's been done 10 years ago or transmission line pulses or that type of stuff. That's been done 10 years ago, but this is where currently people are looking at, uh, at, at what's going on. On the USB uh, 4, and then you know, you can talk about 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 picofarad in the whole lot, but that's not good enough. You're going to have to look at more information about the, 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 the whole package uh, transfer function here. So, I think that's it. A bit, a bit longer than usual because uh, uh, ESD uh, is not so simple. Uh, so, we're talking uh, on data lines or sorry, on power lines about simple old Zeners technology. But uh, once we go into these high speed da data lines, actually, it's a uh, complex IC technology. Uh, and I just uh, wanted to give, make sure that uh, everybody had a good feeling about the ESD as we are spending a lot of time and effort uh, in the company to uh, develop the product portfolio. Any questions? It's a lot of information, so that's why hopefully it's recorded. Uh, you can look at it a second time if uh, this is what you like to do uh, and, and you find this type of stuff interesting. Uh, always uh, do not hesitate to ask me more uh, and uh, uh, information. And uh, yeah, um, think about it all. It's uh, very complex, uh, but uh, uh, interesting. Let's put it like that. Thank you, Jos. You have a good teacher and uh... I have the sensation to go back to university now. I am getting uh, younger. <laughs> yeah, uh, Jean-Jacques, we have to keep up. And uh, he yeah. said, I mean, uh, the the old days uh, when you could sell uh, TVS, uh, SMB for 25 cents, we're not bad either, but, uh, you know, <laughs> the world changed and we cannot stop. Huh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jos. It's very, very interesting and very well done. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. And so it's recorded and uh, we'll share the uh, presentation. And uh, I have two errors I found, so I will update it. And then uh, have a nice afternoon. Thank you. You too. Have a nice afternoon. You too. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.